I wanted to thank you, Kate and uh, Linda, for this opportunity, but just uh, something quick and funny. So if you would have asked me probably about a year ago if I saw myself standing up here talking about how the SBDC, thank you, factors into the world of workforce development, I probably would have said, I don't think so. Uh, but in the last couple of months, I've had the opportunity to connect with a number of very critical folks that have led me to make very intentional and deliberate decisions on behalf of the organization in terms of our alignment and strategy and looking at how we at the Small Business Development Center will work more closely in ensuring that we maintain an ongoing dialogue with all of you in terms of this workforce development conversation. Uh, my uh, relationship with Walter Callender recently, Linda Katz, Julian, Rick Brooks, really in the last six months. And um, I had an opportunity to travel with Linda and Rick just a couple of days ago. We're fresh from Washington. We attended a National Skills Coalition conference. But what I've discovered in the last couple of months as I've gotten more engaged in these conversations is, who is the SBDC? What do you guys do? Are you the SBA? Are you part of EDC? What, what are you? And so I really appreciate the opportunity to be able to give you information on who we are and how we can be a partner together in making sure that we cultivate our small business community, AKA employers, to translate uh, that growth and strategy development for them into job and employment opportunities for our community. And so the Small Business Development Center is part of a national network. We are the most comprehensive assistance network in the United States and all of its territories. We help new entrepreneurs realize their dream of entrepreneurship, and we assist existing businesses with growth and sustainability efforts, recognizing that it's a very complex marketplace, and so we offer uh, that assistance in this ever-changing global economy. So nationally, the SBDC is comprised of 62 lead offices, of which Rhode Island has one, we also have a network of 1,000 service centers, of which Rhode Island has four. So what is it that we do? We provide no-fee technical assistance, low-cost training programs, connection to capital. So the no-fee technical assistance relates to connection to capital because what we're able to do is provide free business counseling, but we tend to stay away from the word free because there is a value to what we extend. And so with our lending community, what we do is we help our, um, our clients develop their business plans, their financials. We're actually on the ground. We get to the nucleus of the business in providing that technical assistance. And you can uh, uh, obviously note the, the other uh, services and resources that, that we provide. So in Rhode Island, we've been around since 1983 and we started our relationship with Bryant University. We have since uh, uh, developed a relationship with Johnson & Wales, who is our host institution, and we've been there for close to six years. We've got nine staff members to cover the entire state. But the very unique, the uniqueness of the model in Rhode Island, which is nationally recognized, so it's not done by any other SBDC across the country, is that we have an external consultant model. So what we do is we've got former um, lending executives. We've got marketing and PR executives who are part of our consultant model, recognizing that businesses have very distinct needs and need help with increasing their sales, their marketing. They need help with developing their financials so they can get access to capital, which will help retain and create jobs. So we've got this great model where we can provide in-depth business counseling, not only by way of our staff, but this amazing uh, external consulting model that we have. The uh, four regional offices is key because they're centrally located around the state. 
We've got an office covering Northern Rhode Island, Central Rhode Island, one in Metro Providence, and one in Newport County. And each regional director that staffs an office is an expert in that particular region and cluster of, or industry clusters that represents the vitality that helps drive that local economy. And so it's very important that we connect with state, municipal uh, folks that help us develop uh, programs to meet the needs of those businesses. And these are our funding partnerships. So we are an SBA resource partner, however, we're not SBA. We are um, a department of Johnson & Wales University, and we are a partner to the Economic Development Corporation. Uh, and Keith and I have developed a great relationship um, over the last year in working very closely with um, focusing on the governor's um, urban initiative and other initiatives uh, that we recognize will continue to foster the development of um, uh, the, the needs of, of the business community. So just to give you an idea of our impact and also how this started to lend into why we made a critical decision to be more involved in the discussion of workforce development, you can obviously see by our numbers that as a small organization, we've had some amazing results. We've counseled close to 700 clients in 2011, and we dedicated over 13,000 counseling hours to these businesses. I just want to make sort of a quick analogy. So if you recall in, in the beginning of the presentation, uh, I talked about that free technical assistance. If our business community were to have gone out and very conservatively spent $100 an hour, with a private consultant, whether it be an accountant, a marketing person. Uh, number one, they probably wouldn't have had the budget to be able to sustain uh, that kind of uh, activity. But what we were able to do as a result of our funding partners and the way our model works, if you look at the 13,000 hours and you do the math, and I just gave you an example if it cost $100 an hour for private sector resources to do what we just did. We just saved the business community over a million dollars in 2011. So I wanted to share this information with you so that you can go back into your communities and recognize that you have a partner with the Small Business Development Center. And we are very involved with the community and we do offer very critical resources. We helped our clients with close to $28 million of capital infusion. This capital infusion helped create over 500 new jobs, helped retain over 1,400 jobs. And again, this is why we made a very intentional and deliberate decision to be a lot more involved and engaged in these conversations. So in Rhode Island, this is our small business profile. Um, We've got over 93,000 small, 93, small businesses in Rhode Island, uh, of which we've got over 23,000 of those being small employers, meaning under 500 employees. Close to 70,000 of those 93,000 total small businesses are not employers So they're sole proprietors, their home-based business, micro-businesses. And these are the ones we're also working with very closely because these non-employers will turn into employers with the right kind of help and the right kind of assistance. So these folks represent over 70% of our small business community. And you'll see the large employer number. So large employers representing anywhere over 500 employees represents over 1,000 companies in the state. So information that I just kind of reviewed, uh, small businesses represent 95% of all employers in Rhode Island. They employ 55% of the private sector workforce. Self-employment surged um, over the last decade and, and interestingly enough, the minority self-employment fared the best um, when, when we're actually looking at that number. So when we talk about incumbent worker training, 
Um, and the interesting thing that uh, Linda and I kept talking about was in the business community, there seems to be a disconnect where the employer, when they look at incumbent worker training, they only look at it in terms of training they offer in-house and they offer to their employees under their roof on their dime. What some members of my community failed to realize, which we're now making a concerted effort to share with them, is that when these incumbent workers go home, apparently 35% of them have taken, a, taken it upon themselves to go to their community-based organizations and take ESL and technology-related classes or basic skills classes without the employer knowing, and they go back into the workforce. So that's something that we need to do a better job of communicating to our business community that this, in fact, does happen. But when we do invest in our incumbent workers, this is what we're seeing. It promotes greater job retention, facilitates more sustainability in the workforce, higher wages, future employability. So for whatever reason, that business can no longer sustain a certain number of employees, but because of the skills that they were able to develop either on the job or by way of that community-based partner, it makes it easier for them if, in fact, they become displaced to transition somewhere else. Now on the employer side and from an economic development standpoint, we all know what this does. It promotes growth, it helps the businesses remain competitive, responds to um, worker uh, shortages. The other layer that I wanted to add to this dynamic is that um, the latest Pew Hispanic Center report identifies that Hispanics are expected to account for about 74% of growth in the nation's labor force from 2010 to 2020. And so when we're talking about an incumbent, in, incumbent worker training for low wage earners, we have to add some other dynamics to the conversation. And so sometimes these are folks that have additional barriers, lack of basic skills, or they just don't understand the benefits because it just hasn't been clearly explained. There might be um, transportation issues, childcare issues, in fact, they're doing this on their own time. But there are also challenges on the employer side where this fear that if they invest in this employee, the employee is gonna leave. Right, and that they're gonna to go to a competitor. Or where am I gonna fund this? Where am I gonna get the money for this? Or where is the return on my investment? When am I gonna see that back? And again, that's our job. And I guess that's why I'm here, is for me to be able to work with Rick and work with uh, the Economic Progress Institute so that I can become better informed and better aware of programs um, and initiatives that I can then take back to my business community and share with them the resources that they have available to them. I think there's a disconnect. Um, and I have an obligation to the best of my ability to go back and provide this information to, to my clients. And so the recent activity that the SBDC has seen, probably in the last year or two, we've seen a lot of displaced workers coming to the Small Business Development Center who are looking at exploring um, self-employment. They're looking at entrepreneurship as a vehicle because they're finding it hard to uh, become employed. Either they're not willing to take the pay cut, uh, that uh, so they've been extended a job offer, but. The, it's just not something that they're willing to consider and they think they can fare better on their own. Uh, and so they've come to the SBDC to explore the journey of entrepreneurship. So that's something that we've seen both on the counseling side and on the training side. Um, what we're also doing on the employer training side is how are you distinguishing the skill sets that you need for the jobs that you have available? Because you may have an aging workforce that are, it's, they're retiring, and you have an entry level component to uh, your business, but because you didn't extend the um, skills up opportunities before, 
you can't promote because, there were, again, there was a disconnect there. So what can we do to remedy that now? And how can we make sure that it doesn't happen in the future? So we're going in with our training programs uh, with a different lens and looking at how do we develop HR-related workshops? How do we uh, develop more comprehensive employer-based needs workshops so that they're hiring the right people and they're not extending an opportunity and three months later saying, uh, sorry, this just wasn't a good fit. And so what I see as our role, and more and more the hour encompasses educators in making sure that folks in the world of academia recognize that people in the business community want to get involved. We've got business owners who want to come into the districts or want to be guest speakers, guest lecturers to our young people who can take this information beyond a textbook and who can create linkages and create uh, mentorship opportunities, bring these kids or these young individuals you know, into the companies so that they can witness what it is to be an entrepreneur or look at a particular trade, something that'll spark a, a potential career track. So to the educators, I say, look at the small business community as a partner as well when you're looking at curriculum development. Faith-based organizations. We're working with um, a large immigrant community who looks at faith-based organizations as part of their everyday life. And so we need to engage with the faith-based community to make sure that, again, there is this exchange of information. And with our CBOs, we can't pretend to be everything to everyone. I'm not in the business of ESL or computer technology or basic uh, skill sets, but I am in the business of people. And so what I'm looking to do is develop a cohesive relationship with my network of partners to build a safety net for people that are coming to the SPDC for help. I think we're all in the business of helping folks with their quality of life. And so I thank you for your time today and I hope you don't walk away thinking we're the SBA, so thank you very much. <laughs>